characters in standard English begin with the letters DW, and they are all common words. Name two of them. Wow. Say that again, Jane.
simultaneously. That seems like a good half word, isn't it? What about spelling that? It would be kind of hard and easy to get lost in. Well, as I mentioned, this theme of this week is about a question. It's, more, it's a more important question than any of these questions that we've shared answers to this morning or a spelling bee word that has to be spelled correctly. And the question simply is, who is Jesus? If you had to run the streets of Huntington or Chesapeake on any given day and ask folks who they think Jesus is, it's a fair bet I would say that you'd get a lot of different answers. Similar probably to what Michael Slaughter's team got on the streets of Dayton last year when they went out. And these are some of the questions or some of the answers they got. A good teacher, prophet, a good guy, the son of God. Maybe even we might hear the answer of Messiah or Christ. Jesus once asked his own disciples this very same question. Who do you say that I am? And the text comes from Luke chapter 9. This was right after the feeding of five 5,000 and just before the transfiguration account. And the scripture reads like this. Once when Jesus was praying uh, alone with only the disciples near him, he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, still others, that one of the ancient prophets has arisen. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Messiah of God. We all, each of us, have to answer that question as well. And it is the most important question of our life. The Jesus, just to give you some context, the disciples had been following Jesus for quite some time when he asked them this question. It was after quite a bit of dust had been traveled through, many sick had been made well, and many miracles had been performed. And especially, as I mentioned just prior to this, the miracle of the feeding of and I want to suggest to us today that Jesus doesn't ask that we be quick to confess that he is Messiah or Lord without already having some invested time with him. I know that we are so aware of times in which faith seems to explode on the scene like a firecracker in some people's hearts, and then it often fades away just as quickly as the lights of that firework go out. I find inspiration personally from some of the giants of our world who have come to faith following a very long journey of investigation and quite frankly even, even skepticism. Many, uh, many times people begin as atheists. Such was the case with C.S. Lewis. He began as an atheist and as a skeptic he began to wrestle with the claims of Jesus. And through a long season of wrestling which he wrote about in some of his books, Lewis became a believer in Christ and wrote one of those classic books we know of of all time, that book, Mere Christianity. And he wrote in that book that he sees three choices for our conclusion about Jesus. We either have to base our life on one of these, either that he was a liar, or that he was a lunatic, or that he is indeed who he claims to be, and that he is our divine Lord. And Jesus, I believe, also wants us to understand that faith in his lordship, he, he doesn't see it as just a once and done type of answer or confession. Declaring Jesus to be Lord is a lifelong vocation that's worked out in the midst of a community of believers. Christianity is not a pathway that Jesus intended that we walk alone. It's in community that we see Jesus' lordship manifested in ways that we would never see otherwise. Michael Slaughter, in our book that we're going through this Lent, Renegade Gospel, references how he grew in love for Jesus and in knowledge of God during his university days as part of a small group at the university. He notes how the disciples were given authority to drive out demons and cure diseases when he sent them out together as a group of twelve. One of the greatest stories of the power of community, of course, is that story of the feeding of 5,000. We know the story, right? Late afternoon, Jesus had been teaching and ministering to so many, but then it was starting to get dark. Evening was approaching, and so were hunger pangs. And the disciples knew it. They were getting quite anxious about how they were going to provide for the hospitality needs of this crowd. And they suggested, well, Lord, just, let's just send them away. Tell them to go get some food on their own. But Jesus instead replied to them, you give them something. What do we have, Jesus? Only five loaves and two fish. Did you hear that 
answer and they said, only five loaves and two fish. And here's something to take with us today. That word only will limit us every time we say it. We might say today we only have 50 here in this sanctuary when we dream of having maybe 100. But that word only will limit us instead of release God's potential and power among us. As we release what we do have and what God has blessed us with into his care, God multiplies it to meet more needs than we could possibly imagine. And in witnessing that multiplication, multiplication slaughter contends, we see Jesus' divinity and his lordship. That's why, brothers and sisters, I preach continually that it's so important to be in community as a Christian, offering the gifts that we have. Some of us think that because we don't have much that God couldn't possibly use it. I know Michael Slaughter struggled with that very same thing as he'll tell you, and he's been telling us in the videos we've been watching in Sunday school. He was near the just the bottom of his academic, uh, you know, ranking academically of his graduating class from high school. He felt he didn't have anything to offer God's kingdom. But that is not how God's economy works. Our daily bread ministries, who uh, we many of us share in their uh, daily bread uh, devotional and some of the things on uh, products they produce on the radio, they remind their listeners and anyone using their ministry products that it is many people making even the smallest of contributions that makes their ministry possible. And it's as we witness the multiplication of all of those gifts brought together that our faith is deepened and renewed when we see what God does for us. Jesus also reveals himself as Lord to us as we follow with a whole lifetime commitment. Jesus said to many who came to him and sought to follow after him, all who come after me, must follow him. They must redirect their lives daily to what he wishes for them. Back in the first century when a Jew became a student of a rabbi, the student was urged to walk so closely to that rabbi that they would be covered by their dust, the dust of their footsteps. We might, uh, in contemporary terms, think of the, the mist that arises from the vehicle in front of us on a rainy day. It, it, you hate to follow that closely, right? I know I do. So wherever my rabbi goes, we go. Whatever my rabbi thinks about people, we also think. Whatever my rabbi thinks about God, I think about God. Whatever my rabbi says about wealth and how to use wealth, I believe and I use wealth the same way. Whatever my rabbi says about the poor, I believe and also want to act toward the poor in the same way. Whatever my rabbi thinks about creation, I also think about creation. In our culture, where our pursuit for so many is just a cultural thing to seek out comfort, following Jesus in the trenches of everyday life is a very tough challenge, especially as our culture is saturated with a secular worldview, which just simply means that we draw our security from the things we can get our hands on, money, material possessions, rather than God's presence and God's promises to us. As we put our lives in God's hands and live with that whole lifetime sort of commitment, we also will experience God revealing himself to us as Lord. It doesn't happen just over the course of a few weeks, but it happens over a lifetime of serving a committed life following Jesus Christ. Is it something that we're ever going to figure out totally, is following Jesus? No. I like how somebody once said, life isn't getting ourselves wrapped around the ideas in the Bible, wrapped around God. It's allowing the Bible and allowing our Lord to get His hand wrapped around us. It takes a lifetime of walking with Jesus in community and in sacrificial living to make that a reality. And as we do that, the answer to that most important question will always be at the top of our mind. Who is Jesus? respond to God's word today, we're going to, did I do it again, Dana? I think I did it again. Isn't that terrible? Oh, yeah. Every week I swear I'm not going to forget my bulletin. There it is. As we uh, respond
respond to God's word today, we're going to sing number 297, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. And today, as the Lord has spoken to us in his word, maybe you have a prayer that you would like to bring to the altar rail and offer at that altar rail. Maybe you'd like to be anointed. I have the anointing oil that uh, we can certainly lay hands on you and anoint you in prayer. But let us respond to God, no matter what way the Spirit might be moving upon us today. As we sing in response, number 297, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Let's stand as we're able to say, without becoming friends, we've seen prayer. 